without further ado, we're going to just uh, enter into the Word of God tonight, and we're getting ready for a powerful sermon. And um, the guest speaker tonight is um, somebody that is that I know very well. Um, and he's known me. We, we we go way back, all the way back to, you know, the maternity ward, you know. Um, and uh, he's uh, he's uh, my dad, I guess. If if you didn't figure that out, I just maybe thinking I had a twin brother or something like that. No, um, he's my dad, and he uh, is. Uh, to blame for, you know, me, so, um, (laughs) so, (laughs) he's, he's, uh, he's, he's, uh, he's a good dad, and he's, he's done all right by me, uh, for the most part, um, but, no, I'm just kidding, he's a great dad, and, and, uh, he's a very hard worker, he works in the maintenance field, and is universally certified in maintenance, which is, I don't know if any of you know that, it's kind of like a big deal. Um, but he's also uh, a minister. He's also a boxer. Um, and he at one point, not that we're boasting the flesh here, but I'll just, I'll just tell you, he was at the age of uh, 55, he started boxing. And was it 56, 7, 58, somewhere? He, uh, he knocked some dudes out. I don't think he knocked anybody out, but he won an international boxing tournament. So, He's a, he's a boxing champ, uh, so um, he's just a, but that's not what we're here to go over tonight, <laughs> but if, you know, <laughs> yeah, so no, anybody gets out of line, he'll, no, um, but he's also a minister, he's an ordained minister, and I remember when he went to go get his ordina- ordination, I was probably in college uh, somewhere around that time, and um, how important it was to him. Uh, any, any of you know who Morris Cirillo is? Anybody ever heard of that guy? Morris Cirillo. He's actually more, pro, he's like an international minister, but you'll see him on TV from time to time. He's got internet ministry as well. So he does crusades and everything. So my father is ordained under Morris Cirillo Ministries, has been for probably close to 10 years, I would imagine now. And uh, he, um, the reason I had us play that song earlier is because he is a, bold and wild and radical man of God, and uh, he's very intense, so things might get intense tonight, you know, so just buckle your seatbelt, but it's going to be good, Um, but he is actually a great spiritual warrior, and uh, one time he told me, he, he told me, and he does this thing sometimes where he'll like he'll he'll kind of get real intense and he'll get my phone. You know what this means? <laughs> and so he, one day he told me he said, "Kelsey, you know my name's Mark. Do you know what that means? Do you know what the name Mark means?" I was like, "Dad, you know I don't I don't know if I really care, but it's okay. <laughs> go ahead, go ahead and tell me." And he says, "It means man of war, man of war." So <laughs> he's a man of war. And uh, now that I just totally roasted him, uh, we're going to have him come up and get, share the word of God. Uh, he's an anointed word, uh, preacher. So would you just stand your feet like we do our life point? Would you just welcome him? And just prepare your hearts to receive everything from the word tonight. Amen? Thank you. Thank you. It's a privilege and honor to be here tonight. Pastor Tommy called me. And I want to say to those two gentlemen that were dancing up here, the anointing didn't show up until they did that. The anointing did not show up until they, until they cut loose. So I want, to, I want to tell those guys thanks. And let's just bow our heads and pray for their ministry. Heavenly Father, for those two dancers that came up here tonight, we ask, that, Heavenly Father, that you open doors that no man can shut for their lives. We ask that you enhance it and enlarge their tent, enlarge their ministry, enlarge their influence in the days to come. And we ask that you give them every gift that they need. So, Father, we ask that you uh, enlarge their gift, enlarge your gifting, uh, 
It may start small, but the Heavenly Father it can end up large. So we thank you for the anointing they brought in the house tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, what I'm here to talk about um, is, I guess I'll give you the title of my message. It is the church from defense to offense through the blood. From defense to offense through the blood. Um, like Kelsey said, and I'll give you, you know, he kind of touched my background for the most part. Um, let's see, what else could I add to that? I guess I've been a member of Grace Fellowship Church is where I'm stationed at right now. Um, I do know many of you here tonight. And, and it's just a privilege that Tommy called me and asked me if I would... Uh, come and, and speak to you all and if I had something on my heart so uh, what I'm prepared to share is what I have on my heart and it is a little lengthy but if you can just bear with me so um, let's stand to your feet for a second would you I, I believe in faith confessions you know before you ever receive anything you're going to have to speak it first and then sometimes when you speak it and you speak it and you speak it and you speak it and you don't see it come to pass, it says Abraham was strong in faith, giving glory to God. Well, isn't he, you know, he's, he spoke his name over and over and he believed God and it's counted to him for righteousness. But it's when he started giving, when, he, when his lifestyle showed glory to God. So when the next step, somebody may need this tonight, you're, you're speaking the word, you're speaking it, you're speaking it, and this is not on the message tonight, but I just feel like those guys brought the anointing in. You may need to start giving God glory because that's the act of faith he's waiting on. That's the act of faith he's waiting. You've been confessing, you've been believing, you've been standing in faith, but you're not giving him glory. And when you start giving him glory, that's when the answer comes. That's when the answer will show up to whatever you're standing in faith for. I could share a story with uh, my daughter on this situation. Kind of drifted away from the Lord, but I'm not going to get into all that. I'm not here to do that tonight. But I will say, it's when I started giving God glory. It's when I started giving him glory for over that situation that things started to change. Um, again... What I want us to, anybody know Mark, Mark 9, 23? It says, if thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. I want, us to, I want us to repeat after me. I am a believer. Therefore, all things are possible to me because of what Jesus did for me at Calvary. I am a believer. Therefore, Therefore, all things things are possible possible to me. me. Thank you. You may be seated. So is it James? Can you put up Revelations 1, 5, and 6? So I've got this outline, and I'm going to... I already got off the outline, so... But uh, the premise of what I've got to talk to you about tonight is the blood of Jesus. And um, the first scripture I have, and if you want to go there, I'm going to go kind of fast. Uh, and there it is, Revelations 5. And, it, and I sh- probably didn't put this down, but it should be Revelations 5 and 6. And Jesus Christ, who's a faithful witness and first begotten from the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us, from our sins in his own blood. Thank God for he, wa- he washed us in his own blood. He defeated the enemy with the blood. Everything's been done with his blood. It's a blood covenant. Um, and he, he made us kings, verse 6, and priests unto God the Father. To him be the glory and dominion forever. So he made us by the shedding of his blood, we get to be kings and priests here on this earth. We get to be kings and priests. What are kings do? Like what Kelsey said earlier, you may not be a prophet. You may, uh, you may be like Anna that served in the house of God only praying. And that might be your role. You, but there's one thing you can do. You can decree and declare because you are a king. You've been restored 
to this earth and what Jesus restored, Adam, uh, what Adam's fall, he restored. That we will reign in this life by kings, by one Christ Jesus, right? Romans 5, 17. Um, so, and what do priests do? They bring sacrifices. Well, in the old days, they used to take the blood of goats and calves and they'd cut them up and they'd sacrifice blood sacrifices. Well, we don't do that now, but we take the blood of Jesus and we speak it. And we are priests by the blood of Jesus. So we're kings and priests. So that's the premise of the scripture tonight. So I'm going to go through uh, the rest of this kind of quickly because I've got a lot to cover. But again, the title of this message is the church from, a, from defense to offense through the blood. And this, these scriptures I'm about to give you is how Jesus responded to accusations. How Jesus responded to accusations. So we're, had James, if you go to uh, Luke 6, 1, uh, 6, 1 through 11. And it came to pass, and you can catch up with me. I got a lot coming at us here. So, And it came to pass the second Sabbath after, after the first, and he went through the cornfields. And his disciples plucked the ears of corn and did eat, rubbing them in their hands. And certain Pharisees said unto them, Why do you, why do you, why do ye, why do you that which is not lawful on the, on the Sabbath days? And Jesus answered and said, Have you not read as much as this, what David did when himself was a hungered and they which were with him? And they went into the house of God and did eat the showbread and gave also to them that were with him. Which it, which it is not lawful to eat, but for the priest alone. So, uh, verse 5. And he said to them, The Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. And, it, and in verse 6. And it came to pass also on another Sabbath that he entered in the synagogue and taught, and there was a man whose right hand was withered. So back, if we, if with those first five verses, the Pharisees were trying to catch him. They're try, they were constantly trying to catch him in his words. Um, and he, they were trying to constantly um, change his narrative. They didn't like what he was saying, didn't like who he really was. And he called them out for it. Verse 7 says, And the scribes and Pharisees watched whether, they would, whether he would heal on the Sabbath, that they might find an accusation against him. Okay, so here we have Jesus. Can you, can you imagine this? Somebody that, you know, says, stretch forth thy hand and, and be whole. And, and what, are we, what are we more concerned about? Him doing something wrong in the Sabbath. Him doing, so an accusation. So that's, they were more concerned. They didn't want to change. They wanted to ha have that spirit of religion. They wanted to have that spirit of uh, we're right and you're wrong. But he knew their thoughts in verse 8 and said up to the man with the withered hand, Rise up and stand forth in the midst. And he rose and stood forth. And then Jesus, uh, and then said Jesus to, to, unto them, I will ask you one thing. Is it lawful on the Sabbath days to do good or to evil, to save life or to destroy it? And looking round about upon all them, he said unto them, Stretch forth thy hand. And, and he did so, and his hand was restored whole as the other and they were filled with madness and communed one another what they might do to Jesus so here we have they're planning they're, it's like wow they, they got wound up tight because Jesus healed this guy on the Sabbath day I mean they just that frustrated him so you know um, now moving on we'll go to Matthew this is some of these are kind of long, so just bear with me. Um, Matthew 22, 15 through 46. Matthew 22, 15 through 46. So, again, what I want to reestablish is how did Jesus handle the Pharisees? How did he handle um, opposition uh, against what he was saying? Now, here he could have straightened them all out. You know, he could have... He could have um, I mean, he had every right, but that wasn't the plan of God. The plan of God was that he would shed his blood, and it says, for this purpose, 1 John 3, 8, for this purpose was the Son of God manifest, to destroy the works of the devil. 
it isn't just for salvation that Jesus came. He came to destroy the works of the devil. Make no mistake, he came to destroy the works of the devil. So that's one of the reasons he came. It isn't just, it's salvation is good, but that's just part of it. That's not all of it. Okay, Matthew 22, 15. Then the Pharisees took counsel how they might entangle him in his talk. Want to entangle, so when you get out in the work world and, you know, people know you're believers, what do they like to do? They like to see if they can get your goat. They like to find out where your goat's tied. You know, they like to find out where the goat's tied. So they, they, they'll start, or they'll like to, you know, I like to, I like to tell Kelsey we're in this push-button world. Uh, if, if there's un unbelievers and you make them feel un uncomfortable, they like to push your buttons. And when they push your buttons, they're, they're trying to find out where your goat's tied. And they never found out where Jesus' goat was tied. Okay, he, let me just say this. The enemy, Jesus was never surprised. He was never surprised by what the Pharisees or what the enemy was going to do. And that's the level of where the church is headed. The church is headed that there's nothing going to surprise us. Okay, verse 16, and he sent... Sent out, uh, in, and they sent out uh, in the disciples with the Herodians, saying, Master, we know that thou art true and teachest the way of God. In truth, neither carest thou for any man, for thou regardest not a person of men. Tell us, what thinkest thou? Is, is it lawful to give tribute to Caesar or not? But Jesus perceived their wickedness. Wow. He perceived their wickedness and said, Why tempt me? You, you hypocrites, show me, the, show me the tribute money. And they sh brought him a penny. And they said unto him, Whose image is on the subscription? And they say unto him, Caesar's. Then said unto him, them, render their, then Jesus said unto them, Render therefore C uh, unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and then unto God and the things that are God's. So when they heard these words, they marveled and left him. And went their way. They, so he did. He mar, they, they marveled. So the same day, okay. So okay, we got the Pharisees. Strike one, strike two is coming. The Sadducees are going to come in. The same day, the Sadducees, which uh, say uh, there is no resurrection, asked him, saying, "Master, Moses said, if a man die having no children, his brother shall marry his wife and raise up the seed of his brother." Now they're worth. There, with, there were with us seven brethren. The first, when he married the wife, deceased, and having no, having no issue, left his wife unto the brother. Likewise, the second, and the third, and the, unto the seven. And the last of, and last of all, the woman died also. Therefore, in the resurrection, whose wife shall she be of the seven? For they all had her. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Ye do err, not knowing the scriptures. Or the power of God. Uh, I'm hoping Jesus, if he came back now, he wouldn't say that about the church, that we're erring, not knowing the scriptures. So I want to, if you, you need to, we all need to increase our time in the word. Amen. We all need to increase our time in the word. Um, you, we all want to, we're all ordained and we all have the anointing. We have an unction from the Holy One and we know all things. Amen. Uh, that is... Um, 1 John 2.20, you have an unction from the Holy One and you know all things. So you have an unction, you have an anointing inside of you. Yes. And, and the, the, God's not withheld anything back. So, you know, to, we're, we're supposed to walk in power, but he, he let them know you're in error. You've got a spirit of religion. You're not, you're off here, you know. Uh, for the resurrection, verse 30, for in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage. But, it is, but, but are as angels in heaven, angels of God in heaven, but as touching the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what was spoken unto you by God, saying, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. Amen. So, you know, us, the spirit world is real, more real than, than the natural world. Yeah. It's kind of hard for us to believe that because we can't see it. But we're going to live a whole lot longer in the spirit world than we are in this flesh world. That spirit world is going to last a whole lot longer. It's going to mean a whole lot more than this, uh, 
in this world we're living in right now. And when the multitude heard this, they were astonished at his doctrine. So Jesus, again, you know, Jesus spent time with the Father. He says, I don't do anything, what I, but I hear it from the Father, and I, and I hear uh, or I see it from the Father. So he didn't do nothing without spending time in prayer. And oh, by the way, if we're living prayerless lives, we are living careless lives. Prayerlessness is nothing for the Christian, but prayerlessness is nothing but carelessness. Carelessness, that means the enemy is going to hit you, he's going to sucker punch you, and there's not much you're going to be able to do about it. But when you're prayed up, you can see things coming. You can understand, you, you can withstand what, what's thrown at you. Okay, then let's see. Let's, let's go back down to 35 here. You know, we can say, well, verse 34, but the Pharisees heard, had heard that he put the Sadducees in silence. They were, being, they were being gathered together. Then one of them, which is a lawyer. Okay, here we go. I don't want to step on any lawyer's feet. But, you know, a lawyer, an attorney can ask a question six different ways to get the result they want. They can ask, you know, forward, backward, sideways, upside down. So here we go. Let's, let's send the lawyer in. We'll, we'll, he'll keep asking the question until we get what we want. I mean, I, I'm not trying to put lawyers down. They've got a job to do, and we have to have the rule of law. Um, so, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? And Jesus said, and Thou shalt love the, God, the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first great commandment, and the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. While the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, saying, What think ye of Christ? Whose son is he? They say unto him, The son of David. And he saith to, unto them, How then doth David, David in the spirit call him, Lord, call him Lord, saying, Lord said unto him, the Lord, Sit thou on my right hand till I make thy enemies thy footstool. If David then call him Lord, how is it that he is his son? No man was able to answer a word, nor durst, any man from that day forth ask him any more questions. So here, what they were trying to do, set him up. You're going to go out in the work world tomorrow, and somebody could try to set you up. They could try to trip you up, okay? So, you know, if that happens, you just need to step back and let the Holy Spirit rise up inside of you. But Jesus, you know, here he, he saw, he answered every question correctly. Okay, now I want to just talk a little bit. This is not, you know, I'm, I'm kind of a late bloomer. Um, yeah, I started boxing at age 55. You know, I don't want to get into that too much. Like Kelsey said, I won ringside world championships at age 57. I got ordained as a minister, like Kelsey has said, about, about eight, nine years ago. Uh, so it's never too late. Someone may be sitting out here tonight thinking it's too late for me. No, it's not too late. It's not too late to do the things that God's called you to do. It's never too late. It's never too late, okay? So I, someone needed to hear that tonight. I, you know, so I just, that's not in my notes. Um, but we can do all things through Christ which strengthens us. We can do all things through Christ which strengthens us. We can do all things through Christ which strengthens us. When it's Jesus doing the strengthening, then we can do it. If it's us ourselves, we can do it for a little while, but willpower won't be enough. It won't be enough. Well, let's go to Mark chapter 12, verses 1 through 12. And they began to speak to them by the parables. By parables. And, and of course, this one here is where Jesus is telling them, this is the kind of people you are. Yeah, so he's telling the Pharisees, A certain man planted a vineyard and set a hedge about it and digged a place for the wine fat and, and built a tower and let it out to the husbandmen and went far out into the country. Far into the country. And at a season he sent the husbandmen a servant that he might receive 
from the husband, husbandman of the fruit of the vineyard. And they caught him, beat him, and sent him away empty. And again he sent another servant, and, and at him they cast stones, wounded him in the head, and sent him away shamefully and handled, uh, shamefully handled. And again, verse 5, he sent another, and him they killed, and many others beating some and killing some. Having yet therefore one son, his well-beloved, he sent him, also, uh, sent him also last unto them, saying, They will reverence my son. But those husbandmen said among themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and the inheritance shall be ours. And they took him and killed him and cast him out, in, out of the vineyard. What shall the Lord of the vineyard do? He, he will come and destroy the husbandman and give the vineyard unto others. And, and have you not read in the scripture, the stone which the builders rejected is become the head of the corner. This is, this is the Lord's doing. It's marvelous in our eyes. And they sought to lay hold of him, but feared the people. So they, they sought, here we go, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, they're all trying to, you know, they knew that he was talking about them. And uh, for they knew that he had spoken the parable against them, and they left him and went their way. So basically he told them the truth of who they were. Uh, sometimes Jesus tells us the truth about our lives. And we got to be able to man up and woman up and take it. We got to be able to, you know, understand. And and but these people were not going to take it. They 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 were going to. Um, Jesus said, basically, this sect of Jews were Pharisees. They're basically religious people. Basically, he said, "You're you're of the fa your father, the devil." So he called them straight out. Basically, he said, "You're Luciferians." I mean that's kind of what he's saying to him. You're 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 not you're not of you're not of my father. Okay, so again, Mark 15, 2 through 11. Mark 15, 2 through 11. Pilate asked him, "Art thou the king of the Jews?" And he answered, and said unto him, "Thou sayest it." And the chief priest accused him. Here we go. The chief priest accused him of many things, but he answered nothing. And Pilate asked him, saying. Answers thou nothing? Behold, uh, how many things, uh, how many things they witness against thee. But Jesus yet answered nothing, so that Pilate marveled. Now at the feast they re released unto them one prisoner, whom, whomsoever they desired. And there was one named Barabbas, which lay bound with them and had made insurrection with him, who committed murder and insurrection. And the multitude, crying aloud, began to desire him to do as to do, uh, desire him to do as he had ever ever done unto them. But Pilate answered them, saying, "Will you will you that I release the king of the Jews?" For they knew the chief priests had delivered him for envy. So Pilate knew, okay. But the chief priests moved the people. The chief priests set the narrative. They moved the people. And what did they say? They moved the people that they should release Barabbas unto them. So here we see Jesus was accused falsely. He was uh, given up falsely. We, and, and there were many times that the Pharisees and Sadducees, uh, these are just four, four different s sections of scriptures. There's others where... The, where he had confrontation with the Pharisees. Now let's talk about the church. Let's talk about Paul, Acts 22.30. Now I'm not going to read this whole chapter, but basically this chapter is where Paul, um, he basically was trying to convince the Jews. You know, I'm one of you. I went out there and killed Stephen. I was against him. So if you read through that whole chapter, and then towards the end of the chapter, Acts 22.30, uh, on the morrow, because he would, uh, because he would have known the certain the certainty, wherefore he was accused of the Jews, uh, he, he loosed he loosed him from his bands and commanded the chief priest and all their council 
to appear and brought Paul down on and set him before them. So Paul, he was trying to convince the Jews. And of course, you know, sometimes we try to convince people and it doesn't really work at times. So Paul tried to win over the Jews telling them his stature and how he persecuted Christians and he, how he even put a, a guy named Stephen to death. And it didn't, didn't make any difference. They still accused him. They still accused him. Um, and then if we go over to Acts 23, we'll start with verse 27. This is Paul again. This man was taken of the Jews and should have been killed of them. Then came I with an army and rescued him, having understood that he was a Roman. So Paul was a Roman and the Romans captured him. So basically when that happened, they had to stop. But it goes on in 28 and says, And when I would have known the cause, wherefore they accused him, I brought him forth into their council, whom I perceived to be accused of questions of their law, but have nothing laid to, uh, to his charge worthy of death or bonds. So, so what I'm trying to get at here is, if Jesus was accused and Paul was accused, and if you're standing up for Christ, you're probably going to have some accusations coming. You're probably going to have somebody says, uh, say something. And, uh, you know, especially leaders. You know, when you're a leader, I don't do this full time. This is not my full time pr profession. In a couple years, I'm probably going to retire and I'll probably move into this realm. So that's why I said I was a late bloomer. I, I, I got my ministry degree late. Got, you know, I went back. The Lord restored what I wanted to do as a kid. I wanted to have a chance to box. Never got my shot. There was never any time. There was no opportunities. The kids nowadays have opportunities. Thank the Lord they do. And I even hope that they get more opportunities. But what I'm saying is that um, I don't do this all the time. This is, I'm giving you from my heart what the Lord's been showing me. Um, but I, I'm a little nervous up here, as you can see. Kind of stumble over a few things already here. But, but this, is not, this is not my full time. Yeah, so well, what I'm going to say is, Pastor Tommy, how do accusations start out? Through insinuation. Through insinuation. So, you think Pastor Tommy's ever been accused of doing something wrong? Yeah. And, you know, so what has he done? He's kept the faith. He's kept moving forward, even though accusations and insinuations come his way. Accusations and insinuations are going to come your way. So let's go through some scriptures. How, how are accusations to be handled by the church? So James, if we could go to 1 Timothy 5, 19. The reason I'm saying this, it says, Against, there's elders in this church. Against an elder receive not an accusation, but before two or three witnesses. So if you've got a problem in the church, and there's a two or three people, you're supposed to work things out. You're supposed to work problems out. You're not supposed to start going telling everybody, insinuating. You're not supposed to... You know, tear down the leaders. You're supposed to get, if two or three brothers, there's a problem, you need to go to the guy and, and, and say, hey, let's, you know, we got to get it worked out. So, you know, in marriage, you know, I'm not, I've not been a real, any, anything that I, if there's any goodness that came out of my life, I could attain to two people, Jesus Christ and my wife. Absolutely, there's no, there's no, there's, Without them too, I'd probably be in jail, to be honest with you. So, I mean, I was kind of wild, to, to put it mildly. But anyway, nonetheless, what I'm trying to say is that when you work things out in life, at the, in the workplace, between two believers, between believers and the leaders, then's when you have something. That's when you have something that you can hold on to. That's when, when you work a problem out, even though it's difficult to go through, if you work something out with someone, you now have got uh, resolve and you've got 
you've got some bonding that takes place. You know, um, discipline with children, uh, punishment will always with children will always drive pe- the kids away. If you punish somebody just to punish them, it'll drive them from you. But discipline should always bring correction. And correction should be a solid footing to go forward with. Okay? Let's go to 2 Peter 2.10. 2 Peter 2.10. How are we doing for time, Kelsey? Am I, am I okay? Okay. Okay, so... Second Peter, so I'm here, we get, uh, here what we're talking about now is accusations. How do we handle accusations in the church? The reason I covered how Jesus handled accusations is because now that's how we have to handle them. He was accused. Did he open up his mouth? Did he run off the mouth? Did he say who he was? You know, did he, did he do all these things? No. He took it. He took it. All the while knowing there's a plan of God for him to take it. Okay, so, all right, 2 Peter 2.10. But chiefly them that walk after the flesh in the lust of uncleanness, despise government, presumptuous, are are they self-willed, and they are not afraid to speak evil of dignities. Whereas angels, which are greater power, that might not bring a railing accusation against them before the Lord. Okay? So here we have angels. What Angels, they, there's only one angel that brings accusations. A fallen angel. That's right. All the rest of the angels, you know, they, they, they know what's going on. They know good and evil. They know. They'd like to go up to that Satan and tell him off. You scroungy pup. Who do you think you are, you know? I mean, but they can't even bring a railing really, really accusation, you know? I mean, so here we, uh, if we go to verse 30 there, or excuse me, verse 12, but these are natural brute beasts made, taken, and destroyed, speak evil things that they understand not, and shall, not, and, and shall utterly perish in their own corruption. So, angels don't bring accusations. So, believers don't bring accusations. Angels cannot bring accusations even when they know the true state. Okay? Of things, uh, therefore, we cannot bring those accusations. Jude 9. Jude 9. Jude 9 says this, Yet Michael, an archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the... The body of Moses dirt, durst not bring, a, uh, bring, an, bring against him a railing accusation, but said, the Lord rebuke thee. Now, you don't, Michael n- knew this guy. Yeah. And, he, you know, don't think he, you know, I mean, it'd be pretty hard for me if I was that Michael to not put this guy in his place, <laughs> you know. So, but, he, but that's not the Lord's will. They've got their part, angels have got their part to play. Accusations are not part of it. Accusations for the church is not part of what we do for, to our leaders. It's not what we do to one another. This is where the church has missed it in the past. Through insinuations, we tend to beat up our own. What we do is Satan starts an accusation in a church, and then what, what happens, he'll sit back and watch, and we'll do his work for free. We'll spit it out and spread it all over. We'll sit there and do it for free for him. And what does that do? Damage. That's all it does is damage. Okay? So we're not to, we're not to accuse anybody of anything. Um, how are we to act with accusations that are spun out of insinuation? Okay? All right, let's see. First Peter 3.16, James. I don't know, I'm going kind of fast. Sorry, partner, back there. At some point, we, you know, I mean, I know this is, this is a little much for me even tonight here. So, First Peter 3.16, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is 
in you with meekness and fear, having good conscience, whereas they speak evil of you as evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. For it is better if the will of God be so that you suffer for well-doing than, than for evil-doing. So if someone starts to accuse you of things, we're supposed to take it to a point. To a point we can take it. And, I'll, and we're going to get into where, where we're going to... We're going to talk about the Bob Fitzsimmons shift. Does anybody know what the Bob Fitzsimmons shift is? Well, in, in boxing, you've got your boxing stance. It's like this. Why do you have the boxing stance like this? Less target. Less target, right? you got less target here, see? So, you know, you got less target. But the Bob Fitzsimmons shift is down to the right and wham. Okay, so we're going to talk about how the church is going to have to shift. Amen. We're going to have to shift. Okay, so I'm using that word picture to give you an understanding. The church is going to have to shift from defense, where we sit and take these accusations, to offense, where we put these accusations down. Amen. Okay, so that's where we're headed here. Uh, Titus 1.6. Titus 1.6, if any be blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of riot or unruly. Oh, I think we might need to corner Kelsey. <laughs> I mean, uh, honestly, um, honestly, I'm saying this, I was praying about this. There are riots coming in America. Yeah, yeah. And don't get caught up in them. Do not get sucked into them, okay? Okay, so don't go there. Now, the Bob Fitzsimmons shift or the shift that the church is going to have to make. Okay, let's go to Revelations 12, James. Revelations 12, verses 7 through 12. Revelations 12. And there was war in heaven, and Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought against his angels, and prevailed not. And neither was there any place found them any more in heaven. And if we go to Luke 10, 18, Jesus said, I saw Satan cast down to the earth. You know, I'm not going to get into that side. Of it. That's not what we're here for, but... And the great dragon was cast out, the old serpent called the devil, and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world, he was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And if you want another scripture to back that up, you could go to Isaiah 14, 12. But we're not going to go there either. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength, and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of the brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. So we've got an accuser. So all sickness, all sickness is from Satan. All accusations. This might be something new. It might be hard for you to swallow this. All accusations are from Satan. He is the accuser. He is the destroyer. And if he can get us to accuse one another of things, we're doing his work for him for nothing. We're, we're, we're letting him dominate our emotions and we'll speak bad of somebody. Then we're doing his job. That's what he wants done. That's how he's divided the church. That's how, do, that's how he do, does things. He divides, then he conquers. He comes in three we, ways. He deceives, he divides, he destroys. In your own personal life, if he can deceive you and saying that you, you're the only one going through this problem, there's nobody else going through this problem. You know, if anybody could just understand, so he's deceived you. And then what he's looking to do is divide you out of the church. He's looking to get you off to the side. And when he gets you off to the side by yourself, he's coming to destroy you. He's coming to deceive, divide, and destroy. That's how he works. It says in John 10.10, uh, 10, the thief comes to steal, 
kill, destroy. Ultimately, he wants you destroyed. We're not going to let it happen. We have the upper hand. All we got to do is stay calm like Jesus. We don't have to bite when someone starts to accuse us. We just stay calm, cool, and collected. And then, verse 11, and they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives to the death. So what do we do with accusations? We get them over under the blood. That's how we win. We get accusations. So what are accusations? They're words. Who's the one speaking the wrong words? Satan. He's the one saying something wrong. He's the accuser. He's the one that wants to destroy. He's the guy. How do we stop him? Through the blood. The Bob Fitzsimmons shift. We've got to shift and start using the blood over accusations. And until we do, we're going to get beaten up. It's just that plain and simple. Until we shift from defense to offense, we're going to get beat. And we're going to wonder what happened. You know, there's three kinds of people in this world. Those that make things happen. Those that watch things happen. And those that say, what happened? Okay? All right, so don't be one of those that says, what happened? Okay, so getting back to how we're going to do, we've got to shift. We have got to shift when there's accusations in the church. We've got to shift and get it under the blood. We have to take the blood of Jesus. Okay, and we have to, we have to use the blood over, the, over wrong words. What are accusations? Wrong words. So what are we not doing? We're not putting the blood of Jesus over wrong words. Okay? So that's the shift that we have to make. And if he's starting to accuse you, if he starts to accuse you, and that's what he likes to do. He likes to accuse you, insinuate that you're, some, you're nobody in Christ, you're, no, you're this, that. He's this, through insinuation, okay? You'll back him off by the blood. You back, he can't take it. He can't take it. That's exactly right. So kings and priests, we're kings and priests. We're here to rule over Satan. What accusations, what are accusations? They are words. The worst thing a believer can do is accuse another believer. That's the worst thing that we can do. Guilty. Have I done it? Yes, I have. Let the emotions come up and I say something, what I see. No, we've got to stop. That's how divisions take place. Okay? Um, they're the worst thing. Accuse another believer. Even if it's true, you don't do it. Right. Even if it is true, you don't do it. Ain't Michael, Archangel, he knew it was true. He, you know, he, he's up there watching all what's going on here. He, he couldn't even do it. It's not his role. It's not our role to do it either. You suppose Pastor Tommy's ever been accused of anything? Hopefully by not by these, this group. Hopefully not. Hopefully not. Now, what are we saying here? Death and life. James, Proverbs 18, 21. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. And they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. What did God, we're created in his image. We're created in his image. So what, what, did, what, did, what does God do? When he spoke something, it comes to pass. So we are that image of God, image of Christ. So what are we supposed to do with our mouth? Create life. Create our reality. We're supposed to create our reality with our words. If we're not speaking life with our words, you'll never get what, what God has for you. Creating life with our words. Again, like I say, this is not my real role. No weapon. Everybody knows Isaiah 54, 17. Everybody knows it. Well, I'm going to give you a little something 
on this that maybe someone here doesn't know. It says, no weapon formed against thee shall prosper. Every tongue that shall rise up against thee in judgment, thou shalt condemn. I've heard Christian after Christian after Christian, no weapon formed against me is going to prosper. No weapon formed against me is going to prosper. No weapon formed against me. And then they get blowed up by something. No, it goes on. No weapon formed against me shall prosper. Every tongue that rises against thee in judgment, thou shalt condemn. So when tongues start coming against you, you have to condemn those words. The Bob Fitzsimmons shift. We're going to move from defense to offense through the blood of Jesus. That's right, brother. That's right. So that's how we're going to shift. You condemn the words. You put the blood of Jesus over wrong words spoken. And man back there, in Jesus' name, I sprinkle the blood of Jesus because I know one's spoken something wrong about you in the past, and it's held you. So tonight, I sprinkle the blood of Jesus over your life, and I call you released. Through the blood of the Lamb, in Jesus' name. Amen. So, if you've been falsely accused, you've got to do like Jesus. That's why I brought up all that about Jesus. I brought all that up. It was kind of painful to go through all that. I brought it up because Jesus is our example. Mark Colbert's not your example. Jesus is my example. Jesus is the example. Okay, I had, I'll had. i give you a testimony. At my workplace, they, there was this guy, this guy, tremendous worker, tremendous worker. Um, I got accused of, he got accused of some things, and then I got accused of doing some things for him. And I'm not going to get into all the details, um, but this is where I learned this. This is where I learned this. I'm thinking, man, how can this be? How can this, you know, I just come to work. I do my job, I, you know. But what the reason that it happens is because if you're a believer, you're going to get accused. You're going to get accused. You're going to get accused. And you can't sit there and take it and not turn, go back to being offensive-minded over it. So I started putting the blood of Jesus over all this, and the guy behind the whole thing got fired. Come on. The guy behind the whole thing got fired. And now this guy, they moved this guy out of my position, and they were telling me, you know, basically he's, he, this guy's telling me he's not at the level he was on my, where I'm at, in my area, and they're sitting there over there thinking this guy's just the greatest thing in the world. And I was trying to tell him that to start with. So nonetheless... What I'm trying to say is, once I started putting the blood of Jesus over it, the whole thing changed. Amen. The whole thing changed. I didn't go running to all my workers. I didn't come and run into Pastor Tommy. I didn't go to my pastor out there. No, I stood and faced the enemy Amen. with the blood, Amen. with the blood of Jesus. Amen. Okay, so that's what we're going to have to do. Yes. So accusations, accusations. Um, so again, no weapon formed against you shall prosper. Every tongue that shall rise up against thee in judgment, thou shalt condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness of me, saith the Lord. That's, I, that's the totality of 5417. Everybody knows 50, the first part, but do you know the second part? What is the weapon that is talking about in the second part? It's somebody's tongue against you. So what do we have a right to do? If we've not done anything right, we've got a right to condemn that in the name of Jesus. And let me just say this. Go through the Bible. You, there's a place on, on the internet where you can start, and it'll line up all the scriptures about the blood of Jesus. And I recommend, you, if you've got a computer, get on the internet and put in there the, the scriptures on the blood of Jesus and let, let them all come up and go through them all. And the reason why I say that is because a lot of people use the name of Jesus, the name of Jesus, and there's power in that name. And there's, you know, and, you know, I've heard people say, well, they're doing that mechanically or this or that. Well, let me just say, in a fight, 
You know, the last thing in a fight, you better, you better be able to throw that jab. Even if that, that's the last thing you got. You can't throw another punch. You better be able to throw that jab. So if the last thing you got is the name of Jesus, you better use it. Because the enemy doesn't know if that's coming out in faith or if it's mechanical. Okay? So you give it to him. But what I'm saying is, there is no power in his name had he not shed the blood. Had he not shed the blood, there's no power in that name. So if you don't know that, that might be why you're not walking in power. Okay? And unless you know, it's a blood covenant we're talking about. It's, everything's about, about the blood. Abraham had a blood covenant with Isaac. You know, uh, uh, the ram killed the ram, and the Jews had blood covenant. You know, they, they'd, I think it was 140,000 rams they would split their throats. Um, but now we have a blood co Our covenant's better. We don't have to get the lambs up here and start cutting their throats and get the blood going and start sprinkling on everybody. No, we've got to, by faith, by faith. So I want to say by faith. By faith is how we do it. So that's why I'm telling you, get the scriptures on the blood of Jesus. Get the scriptures on the blood of Jesus and review those scriptures. When someone else is falsely accused, when someone else is falsely accused, you know, and it's not right, we put the blood of the Lamb over those with false accusations. I don't want to get political, but there was a guy named Kavanaugh. Accusations. I'm going to leave it right there. I'm not going to get into it. When someone's falsely accused, falsely accused, you know, we as believers, and it's, we know it's a false accusation, we have to get it under the blood. It wasn't Jesus' place to, to take care of accusations because that's what the church has got to do. We've got to, we've got to defeat Satan on accusations before we're going to get lifted out of here. Okay, until we start growing up and, and, and looking at it head on. So Jesus didn't come down here to stop the accusations from Satan. He put man back in that right position. He put him back in that right position so now you can take the enemy. You can take him. For this purpose was the Son of God manifest so that Jack Lee can, can destroy the works of the enemy. For this purpose was the word of God was the Son of God manifest, so that you put your name in there, that you can destroy the works of the enemy. That's the reason Jesus came to destroy the works of the enemy, put man in back in the right position. And why? How we get back in right position? Yes, you know I'm talking about authority tonight, but also the blood sanctifies, right? It cleanses us of our sins. It redeems us. It, 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 Jesus purchased us. He purchased us with that blood, right? He, uh, uh, remission, remission, uh, that blood of Jesus goes over cancer and it sends that cancer away. The Greek word for remission is ascending away. So remission, uh, redemption, sanctification, all these things, um, overcoming power, it says, in uh, Colossians 1, 13, and he delivered us from the power of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of his son. So this isn't on the notes, and these, these are just free ones I'm throwing out there. Out of the power of, he delivered us from the authority of Satan. He delivered us from that authority, and then it goes on to verse 14. I wish somebody, can somebody look up that? I, I don't have it on my head here. Started getting ahead of myself, I guess. Colossians 1, 13 and 14. Goes on in 14, talks about the blood. Okay? Uh, so if someone could read that, I would appreciate it. You got it? Okay, here it is up here. Who had delivered us from the power of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. 14, please, James. In whom we have redemption... Through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Through his blood. Through his blood. So, I'm not here to speak about sanctification. I'm not here to speak about redemption. I'm not here to speak about uh, remissions. What I'm here to speak about 
is accusations. Okay? So if you get, if you get falsely accused, now you know what to do. You don't go telling everybody. I mean, if you've got a close friend, I don't think that's a bad thing. But you don't go telling everybody that all these accusations because they're going to tell other people and then, they'll st- then it just mag- it, it enlarges the thing. And then those people are going to accuse you whether they, just, just out of gossip they're going to accuse you. So it's best if you just handle it like Jesus did. Handle it like Jesus did. This is how we switch from defense, from taking it, you know. You know? <laughs> to dishing it out. Right? right? Yeah. This is how we switch. Amen. And if we don't switch, you're going to be defeated. That's true. Okay? Amen. That's really all I've got tonight.